West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Okay, Andrew Weissman, Manafort, guilty or innocent in a court of law? Guilty. Uh, Gates, guilty. Repeatedly. Gates, guilty or innocent in a court of law? Roger Stone, guilty or innocent in a court of law? Guilty. Mike Flynn, guilty or innocent? He pled guilty so pled, many times, they were going to tattoo pled it. Pled guilty, admitted he was guilty, then <laughs> like withdrew, six times. withdrew and said to the judge, Fal- I falsely said I was guilty. Papadopoulos, innocent or guilty? Guilty. So Durham just told, be clear, that's not just me. That correct, is either just, them out of Dur- their own mouths Durham's, or the jury. Durham's whole thing is predicated on it, it's like a rabbit hole conspiracy that suggests that that the Trump bar paranoia infected his ability to stand back and evaluate whether the probe yielded guilty convictions of people who would have had nothing to do with any of these questions he looked at. It is a view from so far down the rabbit hole that what needs a scrub, what needs some oversight, is what Mr. Durham did for four years that repelled his longtime prosecutorial partner, Nora Dennehy, and other high-level DOJ prosecutors. Yeah, well, the New York Times, as Katie Benner has reported, um, is that Nora Dennehy resigned in protest, um, saying that there was undue pressure by Bill Barr. Uh, that there were they that they were taking reports at face value and they were not scrutinizing it correctly. So I mean, the irony here is is kind of palpable. I want to just have people for a moment step back so they understand how small the difference is in reality between Durham and the IG. Because it really isn't a question of... Let's back up and tell and remind everybody. I tried to do this in real time. But an inspector general is an agency's own watchdog. Interestingly, yes. the DOJ's inspector general is the only one Trump didn't fire. Now, you mm-hmm. can theorize why that might be. He was pretty critical of, of Comey. But on the question of predication for the Russia probe, he found that it was absolutely appropriately predicated. And absolutely. that there was, quote, no bias. And... So he found, the inspector general, that what was properly predicated was what's called a full investigation. To have the difference between a full investigation and a preliminary, you're now an FBI, not law. These are internal DOJ rules. So we're talking about something that's not legal versus illegal. It's just did they follow particular internal rules. The IG says, yes, they did. But he goes further. When he testifies about his report, he is asked about John Durham's conclusion that they didn't have enough. And he said, I was surprised by that because I spoke to John and his concern was not with respect to opening. It was that he thought it should only be opened as a preliminary. In other words, he agrees that there was enough facts for the FBI to open, but sort of a smaller investigation. And this is what the IG said. Who cares what they did pursuant to this? The larger investigation could have been done 
as part of the smaller investigation. In other words, they didn't break any rules. Even under John Durham's theory, the inspector general was saying, this is entirely cricket. So this is really, um, you know, this is a friend of mine from Texas said, this is, you know, all hat, no cattle. Well, so you were on the Mueller probe. I mean, what was it like to know that for four years, another one-time peer, and we should say Mr. Durham was at one time respected and regarded. He came in and did some important work following uh, the Bush years on the, regarding to Jason to the war on terror policies. What what was it like to have your probe investigated for four years? So we were very aware, as I'm sure Pete Strzok and people at the Bureau before us were very aware that there was going to be an investigation of us. And you know what? Our view of that was fine. You know what? If you know what you're doing is done in good faith and you're obviously you could make mistakes. But if you our view was like, fine, if somebody wants to come in and second guess what we're doing and look to make sure we did something, that's fine. What's unbelievable about John Durham is he brought um, two cases that he lost. He seemed to say it was okay to bring a case, even though it was really thin and not really provable, as long as you have some other story. This was Bill Barr's argument, which was, oh, that's fine, because he was telling a more important story. That's not what criminal cases are for. Um, So there was just this real lack of substance to what he was doing. And when you have the IG already doing an investigation, talk about like a total you know, you want to talk about a, a witch hunt or a sort of real wasted resources. You know, there are a lot of things to investigate. There are a lot of things that can be useful in government. Um, if John Durham was really just doing an investigation to talk about what are better policies and practices that the FBI could have and was depoliticizing it, I would have been all for that and said, great, you know what? There's no agency that can't use greater scrutiny. But this was trying to say that there's a big there there when, you know, there's no there there. Um, and so for, I just think the, the big picture, if you step back, is for those people who think, oh, everybody does it. You know, the Democrats do it, the Republicans do it, everybody's up to no good and shenanigans. There really is just, that's just not true. There is a, there is a false equivalency because you have an enormous amount number of cases which were proved where there, as you pointed out, there are convictions, where there is a there there. Russia interfered in the 2016 election. They're continuing to interfere. Um, There are people who've gone to jail who are rightly found guilty. And what you have with John Durham is like, it's a big fat nothing. And it reminds me of the sort of weaponization um, hearings Mm -hmm. that are going on where there also is, they're just falling flat on their face because there is no there there. What is the chance, I just got my first hard copy of the first 85 pages. What is the chance that in these 400 pages, there's any um, information about what there was evidence of criminal wrongdoing for, and that was Donald Trump? So, uh, like, as we talked about just before we went on air, I'm fascinated to know what is it that Italy reported. Um, you have a, the, here's, you know, a foreign country, much to their sort of, you know, it's not in their interest, really, to be saying, look, I'm about to tell you something that, you know, could get very powerful people in our country very upset with us, but here's the information. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be fascinated to see whether John Durham addresses that, including not just the substance, but why it was given to him to investigate when that was not, as you point out, that was not And his he didn't remit. have those powers until Barr gave him to him. Let, yeah. let me ask you where the line is between prosecutorial misconduct and just bad business. I mean, is it proper for Mr. Durham to defy the findings of an IG to secretly get prosecutorial power and then to bury a criminal tip about a president he works for? You know, that, that's complicated. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with an inspector general. Um, there's no, you know, in saying that I think that they made the wrong call. But in order to do that, just to be clear, again, we're talking about internal FBI rules. Do you know how much experience John Durham has in internal FBI rules? I mean, Frank Fogluzzi is going to be a perfect person to talk about this because he's going to be like, that's our bailiwick. That's what FBI agents do day in and day out. This is what I did as the general counsel of the Mm -hmm. FBI. AUSAs in the field who are lawyers, most of them don't even know what that there's factual predication right. rules at the FBI. So this is, and it's also much more of an art than a science. So you have the inspector general saying this is fine. The idea that John Durham would weigh in on this, it's not 
criminal. It's not necessarily misconduct unless it's done in bad faith. It just shows unbelievably poor judgment. And it's also not recognizing what he knows and what he doesn't know. And Betsy said he finds um, not enough skepticism. Um, you know, two people were skeptical enough, or three, I think, uh, we'll come to you, Katie Van, in a second, but I think the Times reported on three senior career prosecutors. One, Ms. Nordanahy, who'd worked with him for years in the Connecticut um, U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, did anyone ever quit the Mueller office over ethical clashes? Or So the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, I cannot tell you how big a deal this is when um, Katie's reporting came out for people who had been at the Department of Justice. It's unheard of. I was at the Department of Justice for over 20 years. The idea of somebody who reported to me quit because they had a concern about ethics. I mean, I would have been appalled and devastated and wondering whether what was happening, whether I made the right judgment calls, where I'd sort of had a failure. It doesn't happen. And here, reportedly, there's at least one up to three people. And Nora Dennehy is somebody who's extremely well respected and was very close um, to John Durham. So the idea of somebody who you're that close to saying you have lost all perspective, I'm resigning. And I'm and according to the Times writing a detailed memo about your issues. The idea that that person has now written a report about people who didn't have judgment. I mean, it is it is I mean, if it weren't so serious, you would say it's really laughable. Um, and also, you know, this is what that's four years of, of John Durham. Um, the, the Mueller investigation was 22 months. Three months, yeah, yeah. I'm um, Katie Benner. I know a new piece just moved on the New York Times website. I just got an alert with your byline on us. Tell us what the Times is reporting. You know, the Times is reporting we're, we're discussing many of the things that Betsy discussed at the top of the show. That this is an investigation that, to you know, that Durham was very careful to say highlights a lot of irregularities, things that he thinks are morally, ethically, prosecutorially, you know, bad judgment, bad calls, and bad actions, but not criminal activity. And I think that's one of the big takeaways, that this is going to be a huge disappointment to the former president and his supporters. But I mean, tying together some of the things that both Betsy um, and Andrew have talked about, this is an inquiry we always forget that began as the kind of review that people who were tasked to work on this team, including Nora Danahy, believed was going to do exactly what Andrew was talking about. It would look at many of the regularities and the bad actions that the inspector general had already uncovered. It would look beyond what the IG could do at the CIA and the NSA. It would again look at the FBI just as the IG had done and try to come up with policies, plans, suggestions. It was going to be a review. They were not thinking it was ever going to be a criminal prosecution. It was only later in the process that, that happened, and that was a point of real contention within the Durham team. Is this where we want to go? Especially because there were questions about whether or not this behavior was actually criminal. John Durham tried to bring two prosecutions related to this kind of behavior, particularly uh, the role that he believed that the Clinton campaign played in fueling uh, Russia rumors and Russia allegations. And he lost both of those times, basically putting him in a place where this report was going to come out and was not damning allegations that Trump and his supporters had hoped for. He tried to see, he tried to take this to a, court, to a court of law and have a jury come back and say that indeed something illegal had happened, and he failed. It is Tuesday, the 16th of May of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Yorkshire Terrier is our hostess, and she will seat you directly. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, because a small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot-smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It always has, and it always will. Uh -huh. It will. Okay, so uh, there was no there in the Durham Pro. And we knew that all along. It took him four years. You know, something that really jumps out at me is just the abject obsession with Hillary Clinton among certain law enforcement types. 
What is it about that? Uh, is it just abject misogyny? I think a lot of it has to do with that. And I have people go off on me as if I'm supposed to know what it is that Hillary did that was so egregious that she that, that she has to be pilloried for decades and decades and decades. I just got to say, I knew something was up because I live in Orange County of California. And it's, uh, you know, let's just say it's been pretty conservative there all along. <laughs> You think Nazis in uh, Huntington Beach are like something new? I mean, Jesus, we were calling surf Nazis, surf Nazis back in the 70s. Anyway, uh, when the Clintons were first elected, I mean, it wasn't a week before. And, and I got to tell you, I couldn't understand. I didn't understand at the time how it was that all of these different divergent people that I knew that didn't know each other all had the same rhetoric about Hillary Clinton. To she's a witch and any other number of things like, I'm not going to let that bitch tell me what to do. And I'm like, what did she say? They haven't said anything. Medicare for all, or universal health care. Oh, yeah, that was like the greatest sin against humanity. Now, at the time, I did know that Hillary Clinton had been part of the Watergate legal team investigating what Nixon had done. And I thought, it couldn't be that. This is just so over the top. I got to say that the arguments against Hillary Clinton began even before they ran, and I'll tell you why. It's because it is get back for Watergate. <sighs> so, I don't know. What it is about certain members of the FBI that just held Hillary Clinton in such disdain that we have to, I don't know what, whatever it takes... Uh, bring her down. Decades, decades, and decades. And then we got somebody like Trump, who everybody knew was mobbed up, first with the Sicilian mobs in New York, and then with the Russian mob. Because the Sicilian mob in New York said, we're not loaning this guy any money. He's tanked our casinos. Not just once, but multiple times. And everybody knew it. The effort even got kicked out of the sharper image. And I got to tell you, they got to do some really bad things to get kicked out of the sharper image. I don't know. Mold on your steaks might have something to do with it. But they. But Hillary Clinton, oh, my God, she's like evil incarnate. The Clinton Global Initiative is to help people. And somehow that's a bad thing. George Soros, at the fall of the Soviet Union, set up foundations to teach people about democracy, and I guess that's a bad thing. He's evil incarnate. And he's Jewish, too, which just proves it. Jeez. You got Elon Musk going off the deep end about Soros. Total anti-Semitic tropes right out of the elders of Zion. But we have to remember that Elon Musk is a child of apartheid. George Soros helped, well, I was part of that protest for California universities to divest from the Krugerrand. And I got to tell you, this is the first time I started hearing about Soros. Elon Musk has 15 times the wealth of Soros, and he's accusing Soros of doing things to manipulate the markets worldwide that he doesn't have access to. But you know who does? Yeah, the guy that repeatedly violates SEC vi uh, sanctions. Rules. Rules are for little people. 
Okay. And I guess we're just supposed to let it happen. We're not supposed to uh, criticize dear leader, whoever that is, on whatever level. Jesus. Everybody's a dear leader in their little tiny domain. I'm dear leader. Perform your wifely duties now. I command you. And what's up with Rudy Giuliani pretending that this uh, aide that he's having sex with is a daughter? Kinky! And then we have to hear from these ghouls about family values and whether gay people can be parents, etc., etc., etc. And this guy married his cousin and then pretends women that he's having sex with is his daughter. Ew. Ew. Oh, my God. I think this is penance. It could be hell. This could be hell. I like to think maybe it's just a little time in purgatory and maybe I'll be able to be raised up into the pearly gates. But I don't know anymore. Sure feels like fire and brimstone. <laughs> Rudy Giuliani, my God. My God. Ah. So I'm just curious, will this uh, young woman get run through the ringer like Monica Lewinsky? I doubt it. And I hope not. I hope this is a lesson to youngsters out there. You know, you better really think twice about who and what you're working for. Whew. I don't know. Maybe it's because I'm male. I'm white. I have a good education. Uh, wherewithal to be able to, I don't know, do whatever I want, I suppose. You know, within reason, of course. None of us are Elon Musk. And I sure wish that Soros would pay me just the interest on what's owed to me. That the right-wing fascist like Musk says that, that they're paying me. If I could just get the interest on the Soros money since we divested from the Kruger end, then maybe... Maybe I could do whatever I want to do. I'm going to go have some vodka in an ice cave somewhere. Catered. Jesus. <sighs> it's enough to make you forget what your point was. But the point is, is um, we're not going to take it anymore. And we haven't. And I still don't know what it is about Hillary Clinton that causes people to go off the deep end to the point that Trump is the better alternative? We can just laugh at him? Well, we knew that Trump was doing some bad things, but damn that Hillary. There's some sort of deep conspiracy in how, how, how can Hillary Clinton get people to like her? She must be brainwashing people. Give me a break. This is right out of that, the FSB playbook. And they fell for it. They fell for it. Got the, got the Supreme Court bot pretty much, you know, only six of them. We have a jurist that, you know, won't take a bagel because of the impropriety of that. A bagel! up against the other six that will take whatever. Rudy Giuliani is selling pardons for two million bucks and he splits it with, with Donnie. What the hell is the Supreme Court doing then? And we know what they are doing. You think those Christo fascists are just kneeling in the uh, chambers uh, uh, praying? No, they're they're tithing to the uh, Supreme Court justice. Yeah, that's how it works. Give me your money and I give it to the jurist. Praise be to God. Jesus. We have to cede morality to this cabal of libertines. Jesus. 
Oh my God, it's just enough to make you want to like throw up in your mouth. Oh. Okay, enough of that. We do have a curated show for you here today. And oh, I better, yes. Just had to check a little bit on the time. And indeed, we need to tell you that, uh, yeah, we have a show for you. We always do. And we curate one as well. So what do we have in store for you in the Bistro Cafe here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Republicans continued their boycott of the Oregon State Capitol, leading to the disqualification of two Republicans and one independent from re-election due to a new voter-approved law. Because this is not the first time these guys have tried this. And voters got a little bit angry, and now they're given 10 days of unexcused absences, and then they can't run again. Yeah. Okay. CNN staffers are enraged at Chris Lick's move to crush internal dissent over the Trump town hall. I told you everybody's dear leader in their little domains. And a Connecticut high court nominee regrets signing a 2017 letter supporting Amy Coney Barrett. Like I said, youngsters, you better think twice before you act. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Pacific Island leaders say rich countries are not doing enough to control climate change because the rich countries don't want to because it's making them money. And dozens of anti-nuclear activists protested against the Fukushima plant radioactive water release plan. And who wouldn't? All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left and just down a skosh at our homepage at netroosradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. Pretty please. It really does help us uh, pay our bills and all the other Cost incurred in running this powerhouse of resistance. If you could afford an espresso type coffee drink and if you could afford to send those funds to us once a month, it really does help. So uh, thank you to those of you who have been so generous over these many years. And uh, thank you to those of you who will consider doing so in the future because resistance goes on. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter while we're still there, and of course on Mastodon and Spoutable, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those, and thank you, Tom. I take care of me, and who am I? Well, I'm at Justice Putnam on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable. I post the show notes and links diary 10 minutes before showtime. And you can find all of those diaries and the show notes and links uh, by going to my social media feeds. And therefore, you can then read the actual articles in which we uh, are drawing our inspiration from. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. Uh huh. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Oregonian by Grant Stringer. Republicans continued their boycott of the state capitol for a tenth day yesterday, Monday, leading to the apparent disqualification of two Republicans and one independent 
from re-election due to a new voter-approved law. They have to say apparent because, uh, I don't know, we can't recognize actual laws that were passed, apparently. No Republicans, nor Senator Brian Boquist, independent from Dallas, were present in the Senate's chamber for a floor session yesterday, mon- Monday morning. That marked 10 unexcused absences. This, this legislative session for Boquist, Senator Dennis L- Linthicum of Klamath Falls, repug, and Senator Daniel Bonham, a repug from Welch's. About 68% of voters approved Measure 113 last November, which disqualifies from re-election any state lawmaker who receives 10 or more unexcused absences during a legislative session. The boycott continued Monday after Senate President Rob Wagner, Democrat of Lake Oswego, suspended floor sessions through the weekend to open talks with Senate Republicans led by Minority Leader Ken Knopp, repug from Bend. Top Democrats and Republicans had expressed hope that the two sides could hammer out an agreement over the weekend to end the walkout. In a statement yesterday, Monday, Wagner said he was extremely disappointed that the boycott had continued. Knopp said in a statement that Democrat leadership offered no solutions to rectify the constitutional and legal dilemma we raised and are instead aiding and abetting a culture of corruption. Ah, Yeah, right. Corruption like equal protection and due process for all. That's corrupt in these authoritarians' minds. Maybe. Now, Republicans began boycotting the Senate on May 3rd. Knopp and top Republicans said they were protesting violations of a little-used 40-year-old law requiring bill summaries to be penned in plain English. It has to be on a fifth-grade level, and it was just too complex for them to understand. The boycott began after House Democrats passed bills on gun safety, abortion, and gender-affirming care that Republicans vehemently opposed. So we have to give in to them. Do you see how that works? Otherwise, we are the uh, party of corruption. Uh huh. Knopp has since said his, prote- his party is protesting about 20 bills it considers to be hyperpartisan. And we know what hyperpartisan to them means. Anything that might hew the line from Eisenhower economy and politics is just too commie for them. Bonham told the Oregonian he will return to the Senate floor for budget talks and any other bipartisan legislation this session, but won't participate in any hearings on House Bill 2002. The sprawling measure would expand access to abortion in rural counties, protect doctors who provide them for prosecution under out-of-state laws, and mandate insurance coverage for gender-affirming care. It's just a step too far for these absolutists, isn't it? The bill would also allow all minors to receive an abortion without parental knowledge, because if dad finds out, they might get in trouble, you know. Which current law allows for children age 15 or older? From April of 2022 to March of 2023, about 4% of the 476 minors who became pregnant in Oregon were below the age of 15. Bonham said the bill intentionally removes the rights of parents. Bonham believes that Measure 113 won't bar him from running for re-election, but to prove that will take a court challenge, he said in an email. He did not provide more information when asked about a potential lawsuit testing the new rules. Article 4, Section 15 of the Oregon Constitution reads, Failure to attend, without permission or excuse, 10 or more legislative floor sessions 
called to transact business during a regular or special legislative session shall be deemed disorderly behavior and shall disqualify the member from holding office as a senator or representative for the term following the election after the member's current term is uh, is completed. Boquist said in an email that he was not concerned at all about being disqualified from re-election. He believes that two-thirds of the Senate has to vote to bar him from serving another term, citing the same section of the Constitution that requires such a vote to expel a member of the legislature. However, that process appears to apply to expulsions of lawmakers during their current term, not to lawmakers seeking re-election for another. Matthew Chapman of Raw Story brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Charter Tuesdays. CNN is reeling from overwhelming negative reviews of last week's town hall with Trump at St. Anselm College in New Hampshire, during which he aggressively talked over moderator Caitlin Collins, told a series of lies too fast to fact check, and spoke to a hand-picked audience of hardcore Republicans who, while they were instructed not to boo, were allowed to cheer and laugh as he mocked author E. Jean Carroll's account of how he raped her. Now, according to the, to the Daily Beast Confider newsletter, CNN's chief Chris Licht is trying to force employees to tow the company line about it, and his threats and heavy-handedness are beginning to anger staffers. The drama began after top CNN reporter Oliver Darcy publicly criticized the town hall. Less than a year after Brian Seltzer was shown the door, Darcy's reported dressing down is an inflection point to uh, that CNN talent, executives, and staffers who spoke with Confider over the last few days said has marked an especially dark chapter of Lick's now year-long tenure, reported Lachlan Cartwright and Justin Barragona. As Puck first reported, Lick pulled aside Darcy and his reliable sources editor, John Passantino, to scold the pair for their newsletter's highly critical coverage of the town hall's spectacle of lies aired by CNN an internal version of the intensely negative reviews that incensed licked. The meeting took place shortly after a Thursday morning editorial call in which Licht unsubtly took a swipe at Darcy. Puck sources claim the media reporter was visibly shaken after the meeting because Licht and other executives had, quote, put the fear of God into him, end quote, and told him his coverage was too emotional. According to the report, Lick's allies then went behind everyone's back to anonymously tell other news outlets that the rest of the staff was angry at Darcy, which upset staffers because, in fact, many of them agreed with Darcy. While CNN employees were already troubled by the CEO's actions after Puck's story on Friday, it was a Fox News digital follow-up article in which an anonymous licked ally claimed CNN staffers were appalled by Darcy. That appears to have been a bridge too far for many, said the report. People are really bothered, one CNN executive told Confider, noting that their phone has been ringing off the hook from network employees flipping out over the situation. I heard zero complaints about Darcy's newsletter. In fact, the opposite. People were glad someone was calling this out, a CNN on-air personality added, and it's a terrible look that he's being muzzled or intimidated simply for saying what everyone is thinking. He's not in PR. He's a journalist. 
apparently the people making these claims might be in PR because they're not letting anyone know who they are. The report continued that all this was going on. Licht is meeting with Tim Alberta of The Atlantic for a media profile. Alberta was in the audience for the Trump Town Hall, which was described to confider as our Chernobyl by one CNN staffer, as network spin doctors work overtime, hoping to generate a glowing profile of the boss. of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A nominee to Connecticut's highest court told state lawmakers yesterday, Monday, that she would not have signed a 2017 letter supporting Amy Coney Barrett for a federal appeals court position if she knew Barrett would later vote to overturn Roe v. Wade protections as a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. Sandra Slack Glover, a federal prosecutor nominated by Democratic Governor Ned Lamont, made the comment during her confirmation hearing before the legislature's Judiciary Committee. As several members of the Democratic majority expressed concerns about her support of Barrett, the committee held off voting on Glover's nomination, citing the late hour yesterday, Monday night. No date for a vote was immediately set. Glover said she wasn't going to demonize Barrett, but when I look at that letter now, I'm no longer comfortable with some of those statements. But I also believed, clearly naively at this point, I thought there were guardrails, she said, referring to judges' respect for legal precedents. And I thought the lower court judges were constrained. I thought the Supreme Court was constrained, and I was wrong. And looking back and knowing what I know now, I should, have, I should not have signed it. Glover added that she is a firm supporter of abortion rights from the perspectives of both woman and a lawyer. A message seeking comment from Barrett was sent to the Supreme Court. Glover was among 34 people who served as U.S. Supreme Court clerks in 1998, along with Barrett, who signed the 2017 letter to leaders of the Senate Judiciary Committee supporting Barrett's nomination to the 7th U.S. Circuit. And that's an appeals court in Chicago, of course, in 1998. Barrett was a clerk for Scalia, and Glover was a clerk for Sandra Day O'Connor. The letter said the signees believe Barrett was fully qualified to be a federal appeals judge. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Who, me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Ugh. 
Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. What grows in the forest? Trees? Sure. Know what else grows in the forest? Our imagination, our sense of wonder, and our family bonds grow too. Because when we disconnect from this and connect with this, we reconnect with each other and build family memories we will carry with us forever. The forest is closer than you think. Find a forest near you and start exploring at discovertheforest.org. It's easy. Just put in your zip code to find family-friendly outdoor destinations near you. You'll also find guides to free activities, games, and amazing forest facts. Give the magic of the outdoors to your kids and reconnect with your family. Find a forest near you at discovertheforest.org. That's discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the United States Forest Service and the Ad Council. We're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Warning. This Civil Liberties Minute contains a gruesome description of a mass murder. I'm Bill Newman, and we'll give another second here for people to turn off their radios. Recently, the editor-in-chief of The Week magazine, William E. Falk, described a police officer rushing to the scene of a mass shooting in Allen, Texas, coming upon bloody torn bodies scattered on the ground next to the dead killer and his assault rifle, including a little girl whose face was no longer. No mainstream publication, including his, the editor wrote, would publish such photos for many reasons. The need for family consent, preserving the dignity of the dead, and the sensibility of readers. But then, the editor recalled the importance of images in our history. The photo of Emma Till, the image of the nine-year-old Vietnamese girl burned by napalm, the photos of Iraqis tortured at Abu Ghraib, the George Floyd video. The editor raised the question whether the media's withholding gruesome images from mass murders is anesthetizing the public whether that self-censorship serves the interest of reporting the news as the country continues to consider what action, if any, to take with regard to rapid-fire, high-capacity assault rifles. He raises the question whether that self-censorship is something we, the public, actually need and deserve or want. After all, if we really don't want to look, we can turn the page or turn off the TV or the radio. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1979. That was the day we lost one of the giants of the U.S. labor movement, A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph spent his life working for black workers and the cause of labor. He organized the first national black union to be recognized by the American Federation of Labor, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. 
The fight for union recognition took 12 years, and the Porters signed their first contract in 1937. Randolph went on to lead the effort to desegregate war industries and armed services during and after World War II. He was one of the leading organizers of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, one of the most memorable actions of the Civil Rights Movement. He also worked tirelessly to break down discrimination within the labor movement. He was elected the first black vice president of the AFL-CIO in 1955. Randolph's dedication to the cause of labor was summed up when he said, quote, The essence of trade unionism is social uplift. The labor movement has been the haven for the dispossessed, the despised, the neglected, the downtrodden, the poor. But Randolph also consistently declared that no movement for social justice can be complete unless it is also inclusive. While organizing for the desegregation of the war industries during World War II, Phillips argued, quote, Equality is the heart and essence of democracy, freedom and justice, equality of opportunity and industry in labor unions, schools and colleges, government, politics, and before the law. There must be no dual standard of justice, no dual rights, privileges, duties, or responsibilities of citizenship. No dual forms of freedom. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at west coast cookbook and speakeasy terrytown chowder tuesdays we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the rogue river in the rogue river valley of southern oregon on the west coast of the continental united states of america where it is currently 58 degrees fahrenheit expecting highs in the Low to mid 90s, uh, with plentiful sunshine and winds will be out of the north northwest at five to ten miles per hour. Clear skies overnight with lows in the upper 50s, winds out of the north northwest at five to ten, and then a few passing clouds early tomorrow. Otherwise, mostly sunny with highs in the mid 90s, which means it could be hotter. Winds out of the north at five to ten miles per hour. Grass pollen is rated very high here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 20 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is very high at level 8. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.12 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 90%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 63 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 62 and sunny. Rome is 64 and mostly cloudy, and they continue to have a thunderstorm advisory that could impact the electrical grid. Kiev is 70 degrees and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 67 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 78 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 65 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 58 degrees with rain. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 76 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. To my Sacronacci of 
The Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Pacific Island leaders are criticizing rich countries for not doing enough to control climate change, despite being responsible for much of the problem and for profiting from loans provided to vulnerable nations to mitigate the effects. Leaders and representatives from Pacific Island nations demanded at a U.N. climate change conference yesterday, Monday in Bangkok, that the world make more effort to put aside differences in combating the environmental impact, especially as their countries emerge from the economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Mark Brown of the Cook Islands said the finance model for combating climate change, giving out loans to reduce the impact, is not the way to go for countries in his region with such small populations that produce inconsequential amounts of carbon emissions but suffer the most from the effects. He encouraged a shift toward grants or interest-free loans to help ease the financial burden on poorer countries. Brown said his country lost an estimated 41% of its GDP because of the pandemic, a loss of a decade's worth of prosperity. He said he will give the message to leaders uh where he, when he represents his tiny South Pacific nation with a population of about 17,000 at a summit later this week at a group of seven leading industrialized nations in Japan, where he hopes to be able to speak on a more equal, equal footing to the leaders than as a grateful recipient to benevolent donors. Brown said efforts to tackle climate change and build resilience to its impacts, such as better infrastructure and greater water and food security, require lots of money, especially for island nations with small populations. He said $1.2 billion a year for the region to spend on climate adaptation and mitigation measures would be a starter. The fact remains that the underlying solution to assist countries that are facing the impacts of climate change is to build resilience. And building resilience takes money, he said. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Mari Yamaguchi of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Dozens of anti nuclear activists protested to demand Japan scrap its plan to release treated but still radioactive water from a tsunami damaged nuclear power plant into the sea, which may begin this summer. Don't dump contaminated water into sea, protesters chanted outside the Tokyo Electric Power Company Holdings headquarters in Tokyo. Holding banners with their demands such as don't nuke the Pacific and stop contaminated water. The utility that operates the plant wrecked in the 2011 disaster has almost finished building the needed facilities to release the massive amounts of water, which has been speculated to begin sometime after June. Even after treatment, some radiation stays in the water, said Haramuchi Saito, an activist from Iwaki, a city south of the wrecked plant. It's a decades-long, multi-generational project that must get public consensus. The tsunami and earthquake on March 11th of 2011 damaged the Fukushima Daiichi plant's cooling system, damaging three nuclear reactors, causing their cooling water to become highly radioactive. 
and leak into the basements of the buildings. The water is collected, treated, and stored in tanks that cover much of the plant. The government and TEPCO say the tanks must be removed to make room for the plant's decommissioning and to, demi- and to minimize the risk of leaks in case of another disaster. Japanese officials say the water will be filtered to far below international releasable levels and further diluted by large amounts of seawater before release, making it harmless. However, some scientists say the impact of long-term low-dose exposure to tritium and other radionuclides on the environment and people is still unknown, and the release should be delayed. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, The Petite. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Don't you?